but uh, the next half hour or so is something I've been looking forward to all week, ever since I found out these guys were coming into the studio today. It's uh, one of the, the best and certainly the most popular bands we ever had in the studio, true pioneers of country rock and roll. Would you please welcome back to the Northern Territory, The Remains. Mike. Through the door, the mist is as thick as the makeup on a girl trying to make it home alive through the kangaroos and the mice. On the drums from Newtown, New South Wales, Mr. Plug Award. <laughs> on the bass guitar, we must have Mr. Sam Jr. Martin. On the banjo, Uncle Burn and Love, aka Sean Butcher. On pedal steel with Swoop Alley Owl, a.k.a. Leo Ivan, the soft and the sexy sounds. And, of course, yourself, Mick, acoustic guitar, and the band's fearless leader. I knew this before, but I found out to a greater detail. The Dailies, or the O'Dailies, O'Dailies, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, were the, were the bards to the High Kings of Ireland for centuries. You know, I, I knew this, but I, I looked into it more recently on the internet, and it's true. We were, we were the the premier bards of Ireland for centuries and we used to sing the songs to the High Kings and write about the, you know, the battles and presumably we were at the front of the battles taunting the enemy. That was our job. So that's, I sort of see myself in the same role now. Yeah. One of the, the strategies we chose to adopt from the very outset of the band was to go out to the country and pursue a kind of a route that was perhaps hasn't been known since 60s and 70s, apart from a lot of country bands, which is to kind of go out to a lot of country venues and play these venues, no matter how hard they are, no matter how tough they may be, and just keep chipping away at that coal face. Well, ultimately, we want to make Australia our circuit. You know, the old, the old country and rock bands, whatever, used to have a circuit, a big circuit. They used to play the country circuits, and that, that's kind of died, except for, say, the bigger country acts like the, the Kernigans and the uh, Casey Chambers. Their circuit is probably still quite vast, and they can do these places, far-flung places. But for a lot of other bands, apart from covers bands, that, that thing doesn't really happen anymore. There were old circuits that, uh, that people like, uh, Slim and Joy in particular, but that tradition of, uh, I mean, that generation of country music artists did play. And, I mean, it was the country towns. Uh, it was where the country town shows and the boxing tents went. At the top end, they'd run their way up through Catherine Tennant Creek. I don't know that they got out to Eastern Arnhem Land all that much. I think the distances probably killed them there. But it was amazing where you'd go to places. I think we may have even gone to somewhere like Warrakurna and found that at some point, somewhere back down the way, a country music festival had rolled into town and played in the bush. With Slim dying, uh, it allowed, it, which was, you know, you know, that was a passing of an incredible era because what he was about was the original touring troops, you know, where they got into caravans and they just toured and toured and toured. I think with the advent of national radio, the advent of television and all those sort of things uh, um, and the access that people have to entertainment now, it's a completely different environment. The coalface is a term we use to describe our sphere of, of operations uh, in country Australia and inevitably the world, playing country rock and roll um, in a sometimes well often hostile environment, definitely a difficult environment. 
One of the most important coalfaces for the remains is Nimmagee, a dusty outback town in central New South Wales that made its fortune from copper. Now its population is 150 and it was here that the concept of country rock and roll was born. The other guys hadn't been out there before, it's a long way. And it was hot and it was dry, it was like this, it was like my, like my eyes are in the summer, you know, in a, it's, a, it's actually an old copper mine, so there's the slag heaps all around and it was pretty wild and um, we had a really, some really good gigs and I uh, had a lot of fun and uh, that's where the, a guy died at our gig. Uh, this young guy was just on the speed and on the terps and uh, having no water and they had no sleep for days and he up and had a heart attack right in front of us. So that was a pretty historic moment and um, that was uh, the birthplace of country rock and roll. Luckily for the young Shearer, the ACDC cover that the band played wasn't the last song he ever heard. He made a full recovery. But by then, he'd given Lee Ivan an idea and had been immortalised in band mythology as the guy who died at the birthplace of country rock and roll. On the way back, we were driving back and I was just thinking, Mick, this is unreal. What we should do is, well, Mick and I were both talking about this. We were going, you got the songs. I like playing this sort of stuff. I want to get out of playing music in the city. I want to do something that will, you know, that will enable me to not to not be trapped in that in that, you know, metro urban environment. I want to play in a band that can get out there in the country, can get out there and amongst other audiences and play a different sort of music but still um, keep a foothold in in what we know, which is the world of rock and roll and the and the city based musical styles, you know, which is and we sort of more or less talked about that on the way home and we had a full idea for what would eventually become the remains by the time we stepped out of the car. I played with Mick in a, just a little fun band. We joined a uni band competition at Southern Cross Uni. And he went overseas and, you know, he just emailed me out of the blue one day, just said, you know, uh, Sean, I want to get a country rock and roll band together. Um, I want you to be in it. And he rocked up, he said, I'm coming back to Australia. And I go, yeah. Turned up and gave me a phone call, said, yep, OK, Sean, you've got to play banjo. I went, OK, sweet. <laughs> well, <laughs> you never played banjo before? Never, never played it before in my life. And I know most of the places up the road, like up the guts from Adelaide to Darwin, I've done that road about pff, 10 times, and uh, a few places in Queensland. So I just took it on myself. I thought, Darwin needs the remains. The last territory tour we did was um, pretty big. We went um, from, uh, from home up the north coast, straight down through uh, New South Wales to Victoria, to Kerrang and, and Swan Hill. Um, and then across the border into Adelaide, uh, then up north from Adelaide through uh, Cooperdy, Marla, Alice Springs, uh, to Tennant Creek, Catherine, Darwin, uh, then back from Darwin down to Tennant Creek, and then directly across to Longreach in Queensland, and then home. The outback pubs, the rodeos, the Aboriginal communities, places where people live a lifestyle that city slickers just don't even imagine. They've never seen it, they can't even fathom what it's like. In a lot of ways it's a very alien experience, you know, it's great. That's you know, the real, the real nut of what the experience we're trying to get to out here. I did a little calculation for the last, um, well, yeah, for the last financial year. Um, I was away 128 days out of 365, so that's probably, yeah, four months of the year.
I quit a lucrative job in the UK, travelling all over the Europe and stuff to do this. And I just I wanted to. I just have this have this urge to do it. Over about six years, he was uh, in and out of the country and and back and forth from TNT. At one stage, I think I think when he finally left, he was deputy editor of Southern Cross magazine, which was um, our midweek um, version of, of the magazine over there. If you're Australian, you, you, you sort of tend to want to get. I don't know. Some people, a lot of people move further and further towards the heartland of it. You know, towards the real dry nut of it. Something that you do if you're born in this country, you feel an irresistible sort of draw to that and to the Aboriginal people too. I think. I think it's really part of it. I think they're really. I think we're in a lot of ways, despite the fact that we come from the other side of the world and we're a completely different culture. I think we have a real connection with them and we're sort of drawn to what they experience. You know, it's something that just it's just irresistible in a way. You don't really, we don't really even discuss it too much or think about it, but it's just something we want to do. One of the things that I've seen with this band as opposed to other bands that I've worked with, um, where you might just have one person who's gung-ho and everybody else couldn't give a shit really. Everybody in this band is, is in for the long haul and they're all, they've all got their eye on the, on the ball sort of thing. I think it just goes to show that we've all, we've all sort of got the same thing in mind, whether it's the remains or country rock and roll, whatever that thing is, we've just got, we do share a, a common sort of goal to, to be able to do this kind of stuff and to be able to play good music and specifically good country music, whatever that means. They just love it, especially the locals here. They just love it because all they see is sort of television. They don't, uh, they don't really leave the, the immediate district much, and a lot of them are coming in from the outside communities. We draw a crowd for up to a thousand kilometres away. They come in from the Tamanai Desert and then all the way through Arnhem Land, right through to the coast. So this is like their cultural capital, I suppose you'd call it. And yeah, any bands that are coming through are a real plus. Because a lot of people out this way and out further will travel as far as here, but to go to Darwin is like a major trip. Mm. So if they can pick up a bit of entertainment and still get home, a lot of blokes out here that work at quarries and crushes and gold mines, and it's, it's 150, 120k trip in a town, then you've got to find a sober driver or a taxi to get you back. So if they can come halfway and roll out a swag at the end of the night and have a good night, that means a fair bit to them. So this is like a, to have a live band on for some of these local folk, this is what it only happens once, once every month or two, you know, so it's a big deal for them. To me it's really important to have bands like The Remains playing original music, something different, bringing a whole new slant on, uh, on, on their interpretation of, of stories, music, up to places like Darwin because, you know, it can become culturally isolated as well as, as, well as physically isolated. People think we're mad trying to get a five-piece band with a PA, travel from northern New South Wales up to Darwin and back again. You know, it's just, just as ludicrous unless you've got a lot of money behind you. But, I mean, we haven't. We've got to do it the way we can. And so far, so good. We don't get lots of the good acts in, in Australia who uh, take it upon themselves to load themselves into a car and drive up here and play gigs in the pubs. Or, or in the festivals and that sort of thing. We don't get that kind of commitment very often, but they do. They've done it for the last couple of years. And so they've developed a, a, a good listenership up here, uh, not only in Darwin and in Alice, but in the communities as well. And it's just a wonderful thing to have a band that you know, wants to come out in the communities and things, whereas normally we always have to travel, go to town. It's always hard work, transport issues and things. So to have people come out here and just have a great time, Visiting the Aboriginal community of Ali Karang is part of the Remains four-month national tour to promote their album Field Conditions. On this Northern Territory leg alone, they'll travel thousands of kilometres. Probably close to four and a half to five, say from the north coast all the way up to Darwin. So then if you double that return trip and then add the extra little 
running around that we do in the meantime, I guess it'll be pretty easy, 10,000. Maybe more, I don't know. It's a long way though. For the first two and a half years, we, we just drove our own cars and it's very tough on them and you know, it costs us personally a lot of money. And um, it came to a point where we just had to spend money and, and um, bite the bullet and get a good van. And it's, it's proved it's worth its weight in gold. It's, it's been really good. What's it like travelling around together in a van? It's a long time to be on the road together, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's we, good we, fun. Yeah, we survived so far. We, you know, the first time we came to Darwin, after that little exercise, we lost the first rhythm section, but they were going anyway. We got warned about this road trip. It's called the Band Eater. The Band Eater? The Band Eater, <laughs> yeah. There's a few bands that have been destroyed on the, on the road from New South Wales up to here. Yeah. <laughs> there was definitely um, con conflict as, as to the direction that the band was going in. Like, one of them thought that thought that the, the way to success and the path that we should have been taking is probably what you'd, I guess you could call it a traditional path. You make, you get the hit single, wherever you get that from, I don't know, but you get the hit single and you get the hit music video, all of a sudden you're on TV and the girls are screaming and you become famous and you take home lots of money and you sit around on your yacht. idea of going out, touring out back locations and playing the hard gigs and playing to indifferent crowds and ignorant crowds and you know, stuff for, for which there doesn't seem to be much reward sometimes. That was definitely not on, on certain people's agenda. And they thought that we were crazy. They thought we were idiots. We had this massive showdown on the, on the banks of the Catherine River in Catherine. What I'm very proud about is the fact that, that we didn't miss a beat and we were able to leapfrog it, play satisfactory gigs and keep the whole machine going. And that was, that's, that's something that's not very easy at all. Despite having a new rhythm section, the Remains country rock sound has always been a constant. But how does an industry professional categorise the sound of country rock and roll? If I was critiquing that, I'd say, and we're going, where is it fit if I'm going to put it into a yeah. box? I think old country. Um, I think that's where it is. I mean, it's closer to Paul Kelly than anything else. It's a grey area song. You know, it actually crosses over. It's not, it's not on full-on country. Um, where you hear, uh, what you're hearing, I think there's a pedal steel in it. Um, but, you know, but it has a fairly contemporary edge to it. My definition of country, of old country music, is the alternative to what the mainstream is. So a lot of people know that I know of country music, and it doesn't really have a great name. Um, a lot of people will turn up their noses at the thought of having to listen to country music. One of the biggest impediments to country music is the fact that we actually have a label, country music. I'd love to think that, you know, that when our music came out, they said, here's another piece of music. But the music that I think is alternative is, is the music that's based from traditional sounds and has some background in real country music and isn't um, completely engulfed in pop sounds, um, you know, like, was the 80s, or well, pretty the early 90s when that big country mainstream thing hit and uh, we were listening to stuff that I honestly couldn't believe that they categorised it as country music. It was very adult orientated rock or pop music to me and um, so my definition of alternative country is the other stuff. And a lot of the sort of modern roots music that we're talking about is based in the city, you know, like I get alt country in a lot of ways is you know, or modern, you know, all that, the new country, it's generally speaking, it's country music that's played by city people, you know. Uh, look, one of the things I think old country would be is uh, people singing in an Australian accent. Uh, the other side to it probably is that you're just pushing the musical boundaries a little bit. You're not sort of sticking right within the conventions. You may have a little bit of a harder edge in what you do. Um, and you may not be trying to put something together which is just simply radio accessible. The difference between 
the pop charts and the country charts are becoming, that's becoming a little more blurred. Like a lot of, a lot of the stuff that you see on the, the, the country music channel, it, it's, um, it's just pop with hats. It's all a bit too smooth and polished and, you know, not, I don't know, I find, I find it a bit bland. When I heard tunes off of their second album, even though I didn't know it was them, I heard it and I thought, oh, The Remains must have a new album. Because I could hear their sound. <laughs> I think that's a really strong attribute, is being able to develop your own sound, and that's what they've done already. Because contrary to most uh, country bands, country um, rock bands, their their rock side of it is, is, is tough and edgy, and that's really, really nice. I listened to The Remains in the car and I thought it was uh, country with a bit of rock in it, but the thing that struck me more than anything else was that it was fair dinkum music. This was music that's written about an Australia that I've experienced and that a lot of people live in and love. It's very unique and gritty and earthy. And it was the kind of music that's being played to people in a fashion which probably has less to do with fashion than it has to do with the meaning in people's lives. I always talk about music, you know, it gets you in three places. It gets you in the head and the heart and in the groin. And I think The Remains just managed to do all of that, you know. Mick and Sean's songs Tell, tell stories that country people can particularly relate to. The music's got a great drive to it and it just makes you want to dance, so it gets you everywhere. I really love Australia and I really identify with it and I think it's very important to people who are here to, uh, to identify with it. And I like to write about the country in, in ways that mean things to me. I don't like to, I think a lot of country music, uh, they sort of tend to do that in a very name checking kind of way in order to prove that they are this sort of certain being. And I'm not saying that I'm su superior to them in any way, but I'm saying that it really means something and. I think it's a good, a good thing to write about and it, uh, by identifying my experiences with the country, people will like that. The topics of uh, country music are, you know, usually the down and out topics. Um, it, it's, it was pretty much formed from people writing about their own life experiences and, and people who weren't particularly that well off. It must be that, that kind of underdog working style person that, that a lot of that stuff's about. You know, a lot of those country songs are about their ordinary issues that, you know, what's, what's that old joke about losing your dog, your house and your girlfriend or, you know, the, the real issues that are from this real base level. The mainstream people like to sell their music as uh, being honest, but it's almost domestic in a way, you know, they deal with Australia as a, uh, as a place and glory to Australia. Being from a country background, I can write a song about something that's happened to me or a friend or an uncle or a relative, and the folks out in the crowd can go, yeah, geez, I remember doing that, or hey, that reminds me of my uncle or, you know, my wife or, you know, and so it's, it's that relation thing that they can relate to it and it, um, identify with it. And I think that's the secret with country music in, in country areas. I guess it makes sense, you know. The guy that works his job in the office in Sydney probably finds it hard to relate to country music maybe than, you know, the guy out working on a land, you know. But uh, the remains are, and people like them are dealing with uh, more uh, extreme, edgier sort of uh, subject matter. And, and, uh, and uh, they're not going to be as acceptable to the to the man on the land, you know. What they've been successful at is um, sing about Australia in a non-self-conscious way, which is not, a, not always an easy thing to do, and they sort of sing about pretty much the lives they live, I figure. I think it's important when you're telling stories to give place names, and Raymond Chandler was very good at that in his, in his stories. He, he, he gave you the small details that you can identify with and you can, you can hang your experience on with that, and it gives you a really a real connection to what's going on there. They're often political, uh, which uh, in Australia normally is right wing, and they're obviously more left wing. On the Remains new album, they've got a, a very strong uh, 
there's a, there's a strong political thread that's sort of evolving into their music. They've also sought to uh, at least instill a bit of the old folk singer, Woody Guthrie style of uh, singing a bit about social justice and maybe imparting a message. In Darwin, uh, I was speaking to a woman at the markets, the, the Nightcliff markets the other day, and I spoke to her last time we were here as well. And um, she'd come to a gig and bought a CD with her son. And she told me then that her son never stopped playing it and they had bought him other CDs to try and because they got sick of it <laughs> and they were he was playing folk singer blues in particular over and over again and he, he pulled her aside once and he said hey mum John Howard pinches lollies from the public purse which is a line from folk singer blues and uh, so yeah we're getting some kind of political indoctrination across to the young folks so that's that's real uh, folk singing it was the coldest fucking winter that I've ever seen When chill back to minus 15 Down at the pub that got a pay in your dues Or in everybody with a 12 bar blues I was in Wagga Wagga, city of crows Crying from scabies and a fucked up nose Woke up, gave the world the finger Hit the road, become a folk singer well, I, went I interviewed, uh the lead singer Mick uh, on my show a couple of weeks ago, and I, I was sort of stunned that here's a here's a guy because I do interviews with country music people all the time, and here's a guy that was using three syllable words, you know, I mean I'm not used to that, <laughs> and uh, that 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 sort of tells the story about country music in Australia a bit. So they could appeal to people who do like country rock but they could appeal to people who don't as well and that's so I just said they could have a real breadth. Um, interestingly I think that the audiences here in the country because they've been so used to the sort of crap that has been foisted on them for the last 10 or 15 years uh, a lot of the times don't quite know what to make of them and you find or I found that there's been a small group of people who really dug it for, for it being original and for, for it being different um, and for the most part the rest of them just don't know what to make of it so they'll, they'll dance around or they'll, they'll just take no interest whatsoever. You know, you've got to be really realis realistic about it. You, you can't get too big-headed. You play in a pub and it's packed out, and next town you play out, you know, there's, there's, there's no one there. It's just like 20 people in the audience are pretty bored of what you're doing. You still sort of fight an uphill battle with... with... You know, cert certain kinds of audiences. It might might happen quite the way you want to. Like you think that everybody's going to tap into the to the experience that you're supposedly giving them, and you know sometimes that doesn't work. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that the music that you're playing or the or the uh, the lyrics of your songs aren't right. It might be just the the particular mood that night. That's one thing we've learned. A lot of country audiences too. Like it, you'll have you know, people get up and dance and have a good time, but other people will sit back and. And that's what we've learned, they'll sit back, but that doesn't mean because they're not getting into it, they're not enjoying it, you know, and then they'll come up and buy a CD off you. Probably the further afield we get, the better it is for, for us, you know, rural people, they just love their country music, you know. Although I've seen these guys perform along, you know, in Melbourne and Sydney and places like that, and it's quite a different approach. You, you get somebody from inner city Fitzroy who just loves them because they're so country in their eyes. Sydney and Melbourne, they, they're a little more restrained in their sort of like, you know, how expressing how they like you and everything. They're sort of up, up here, everyone cuts loose, you know, especially like with the Aboriginal community. And they, you know, if they want to have a good time, they go out and have a good time. Love playing with black audiences, they're great. They're really appreciative and into it from the word go. And I know there's just a special energy about those communities. Uh, I think they're playing this weekend out at Gunbalanya, uh, at the Gunbalanya Open Day. That's uh, the old. Um, community of Owen Pelly, and they'll be playing with Neil Murray, who's another a, a terrific songwriter uh, who uh, really expresses very, very strongly uh, the nature of Australia and especially the bush. I feel the, the authentic Australian country music really lives in these regions from the Kimberley and the, and the Outback. I think it really, really has its. Uh, this is like its heartland, you know. I don't know. It's a different experience playing it in the communities to. People who haven't seen you before, people who aren't used to this kind of thing, maybe, or certainly not, not used to us. When bands go out and play in remote areas and take their music out, play to Aboriginal communities or remote communities, they perform a really valuable function of 
bringing uh, songs, words and a perspective into these places and then when they leave, taking uh, some of that culture and those experiences with them which they then put into their work and so you've got this fantastic osmosis of interaction happening as people tour around the country and there's an intensity to it because it's removed from uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, concerns about you know where you are on the hit parade or how cool or, or, or whatever you are uh, it's much more in your face and in the dirt and I think that it's very real for that people are from a totally, totally different world to what we live in. We're just glimpsing a little tiny bit of it and you know, they really dig the fact that we're coming out there. And yeah, I, I, we really appreciate it and enjoy it too, sort of what we're doing it for. It's really big for the community and especially for the younger ones to get them exposed to a few other things. And nowadays as you know, society opens up a bit, the people are going to be moving and going to other places. Um, and it just exposes them to different culture, different people, different sounds, different instruments. Generally, once they've come once, they want to come back to, to have a look around the country and sort of they enjoy playing for the local indigenous people. Probably because they get such a good response. Um, you know, the locals really like it when people come to uh, perform for them and they, you know, they're always a good crowd. We just like listening to some, some rock country music like that. This, we didn't how have much, much the sticks? bands like that coming into this community. I think it does have a role in reconciliation country music because it was the early country artists that went out and played to Aboriginal communities. Uh, it was quite often slim and uh, those early artists who were the first ones uh, into communities that had probably not heard any electric music uh, up until that time. Country music is very, it's been the, the main genre of music that especially Aboriginal people have tapped into. Although there's other influences there now, but you know, years ago it was Buddy Williams and Slim Dusty shows and Rick and Thel and uh, Brian Young shows were the only shows that they saw, that the, the settlements and communities saw, you know. So, and the storytelling aspect of country music, the sentiment in it is, is very much um, embraced by Aboriginal people. There's a narrative that runs through some people's work. Uh, Ted Egan, who's now the administrator of the Northern Territory, is another good example, uh, where the idea that we do live together, uh, Aboriginal people and Europeans in this country, uh, partly because of what's happened in history and partly because of the fact that we need to live together and work together, understand one another well, you know, you find those narratives expressed in much more uh, kind of better form than maybe the politics of it in their music, so yeah, I think it's got a good role to play. I think the, the link with it goes right back to the meeting place between blackfellas and whitefellas on the, in the, in the uh, campfire tradition. There's influence of Celtic music, folk music and everything else, but there's also influence of the yarning tradition and the oral tradition and sopping. When drovers met around a campfire, I think, I think that's uh, a lot of inspiration behind Slim Dusty stuff. Quite often, workshops are another way that touring country musicians swap knowledge, adding to the melting pot of ideas and music. Today in the morning we did a, a workshop and got to know them even better and just, just seeing the looks on their faces when we you know, set up the PA for them and got the, all the instruments going and they were, they were chuffed. Just seeing the kids smile, you know, they, 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 just they really dig it. Those kids, there's no, there's no artifice about them. If they're into something, no, you know, they, they show it, and if they're not, they just sort of walk away. I, I saw, you know, I saw um, Dave, the bloke, trying to talk to one kid, and, and the kid just pumped. The kid doesn't even see him, you know, he just sort of walks straight past him. The, the, he's not talking, the guy's not talking as far as this kid's concerned, and that's what they're like. If they're not interested in what you're saying, you don't exist. And the fact that they were into what we were saying was, was great. Basically, went through a couple of basic beats and thought, you know, just show them sort of how the, um, you know, how we'll try and create a rhythm that's going to suit, you know, what the, um, the band's going to get, um, like writing a song or something like that. So we just sort of looked at, you know, down beats and then up beats and how to play that on one bass drum because that's all we had. So we just turned that upside down and we were just using the rim for cymbals and different stuff like that. They were right into it. <coughs> it was good. And then we started playing with some different rhythms as well. And, you know, doing some Bow Diddley beats and, and that sort of stuff, so, yeah. The remains, when they come here, if they're prepared to contribute to Bugley Arts and the um, indigenous, I guess, organisations that are around here, are valuable.
terribly valuable people because they offer something that um, depth and of uh, techn technology and depth of understanding that people don't get around here. Uh, but if they're just blow-throughs who aren't offering that sort of thing, their value is limited. Yeah, look, if people have got uh, time and, you know, they don't mind the, the business of sort of making themselves teachers, workshops, I think, can be really useful for people. It's maybe not only about playing and performing, but just the other stuff that goes around being in a band. There's a lot of organisation of mastering different things from sort of, you know, keeping the van or the car going to, to your gear, uh, insurance, arrangements, you know, the legal side, copyright, you know, dealing with uh, other people if you're going to get a gig somewhere and organising who's agreeing to pay for what. And, you know, there's a fair bit there which people need to learn from someone. And uh, it'll be really good. Uh, if a band goes through town and just stays on a little bit longer and shows people the ropes a bit. Even though the workshops with the kids at Ali Karung lifted morale, it's also reminded the band of their families and lives back home. Oh, I feel really tired, you know, and I'm missing my family. And having a, you know, a newborn at home is really hard. Um, you know, I'm sort of almost away for a month now. I mean, the little guy's only six months old when I left and when I come back he's going to look totally different again. He was going to be you know, twice as heavy and yeah, that's really, um, that's a really hard thing and a, and a really hard, you know, that's probably the hardest thing for me. The physical leaving is, sometimes it's really shitty and sometimes I'm fine. Yeah, yesterday Renee was telling me she was trying to um, make sure that he doesn't forget me so We've got the national tour poster with a photo of the five of us, and she's going, which one's Daddy? And he kept pointing at Sean. <laughs> she's going, no, 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 that one's your Daddy's. Sean. <laughs> you know, like I'm constantly talking to my daughters, and, you know, especially my oldest daughter, she leaves these really tear-jerking sort of messages on, the, on my answering service for how much she misses me, and, you know, but they're sort of... Because they're, they're, you know, they're pretty young and they really can't understand why I have to go away. And then I do really poxy things like read safe text messages. <laughs> that sounds really embarrassing. Listen, listen to safe voice messages. Um, call his mobile phone so I can hear his, hear his, um, hear his voice. You know, we're still hanging in there. You know, t yeah, today we had a rest day. And last night at Ali Kurung, that was great. I think we all you know, benefited from that. Well, last night I was sitting on stage and I'm playing and I'm thinking, you know, we're outside in the middle of nowhere and I'm just thinking I could be in a dingy city or town pub playing to, to people who don't care. And instead I'm playing out here to a community to a bunch of kids who are, you know, there might have been half a dozen adults in the, in the audience, but there was primarily there was, you know, 40 or 50 kids running around and you're just looking at those kids going, wow, you, know, you guys are really having a good time. and uh, Ali Karung were definitely the highlights. They were great, they just, you know, the enthusiasm and I think that we all got caught up in that and Mick showed it with his show, you know, coming up there and Ali Karung's number one, you know, country rock and roll's number one. And the, the reaction I got from a couple of people, a couple of the women said they really enjoyed it and um, the kids definitely enjoyed it. We, we, we were, I was walking along the road just back from the supermarket here this morning and, and I heard, heard someone yelling out my name and. There's a busload of kids from Ali Karung and Josiah was the one that I talked to and he was, he was very insistent that I remember his name. He was hanging out the bus window and, and one of the other kids yelled out, country rock and roll is number one. So they obviously remembered that one. We made a, an impact there. I've been lucky, I've known friends that have worked on communities and they go, yeah, well, it's pretty rough. But Ali Karung, just, um, I, you know, I was really glad. It was, it was a, you know, just see the, the positive, positive sort of stuff there. And we had a ball, so you know we, we took as much away as hopefully we gave a little bit, you know, by teaching them some stuff. And... 
Leaving Ali Kurung means that this Northern Territory tour is drawing to a close. So far, the band has played 24 gigs and covered over 10,000 kilometres. Three more shows at Tenon Creek will wrap up the tour and then it's a two-day drive back home. How are the band members holding up? It's been a tough one. It's been very tough. Was that? Uh, lots of long-distance legs. Some pretty hardcore gigs with crowds that weren't really into it as I thought they would be. I think probably the hardest thing is that, like, um, you know, when you're playing in a band and you can all, you know, come together, you can do a gig or do a rehearsal or whatever, and, and that's all fine, and if somebody pisses you off, whatever, you can have a bit of a spit about it, and then you can go home. When you're on tour, you can't do that. You're in the same van with the same bunch of guys for like three or four weeks at a time. So whenever you've got a group of different blokes in a situation, in a, in a bus and stuff, you've always, you know, you've always got different dynamics going on and you've got to be able to sort of ride over it like a good four-wheel drive, you know, <laughs> across rough country. It's tough all the time, but... The biggest thing is just the van is cramped. It's really only set up for five people to be comfortable and there's six of us. We get sick of it because there's, um, you know, there's nothing to do on it. So the, the last, the last haul down from um, Darwin, it, it, it just took forever. It just because uh, all you do is yeah, stare at the bush. We're, we've read everything in the van, so <laughs> you're rereading over old Rolling Stones and stuff. And, so it was good to get out. We've got big personalities, and and for us to to get along for three weeks, cooped up in a car, sharing the same stage sharing the same bedroom, fighting for the shower, wanting to get to, you know, get the double bed first or whatever, you know, it all just, it just steamrolls and <clears throat> gate crashes into one thing after a while and you wish that you could go home. You know, it's kind of this extended family that has to, yeah, work and, and breathe and do all this stuff together just to get to a gig to, you know, get on stage for three 40 minute sets or something, yeah, there's about, you know, 12, 14 hours of other stuff that has to happen for that to work um, night after night, you know, for what, three and a half weeks in this instance, yeah. I was on a bunk bed. The first night, I mean, I actually got a decent bed, a, a lower bunk so it wouldn't be so hot, and the first night, two of the guys went out, got completely trashed, came home, one of them spewed up on the floor, red wine, then proceeded to decline. That was warty. Climbed on the bed above me, which, you know, woke me up and then had another bit of a chuck, some of which landed on my neck, which was rather nice. I think all my training playing foot, in football teams and soccer teams was good training because it gives you, it gives you, it, you know, you, you're able to wear, wear a lot more. You know, it's, 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 it can be a bit psychologically bruising at times and you, everyone gets dignity, you can get a little bit trampled on, but uh, you just got to wear it and um, carry on for the sake of country rock and roll, which I think we've done pretty well. So what's the next stage of the Remains country rock and roll journey? Is winning a coveted golden guitar in Tamworth, Australia's country music capital, part of the plan? You never see an even remotely left field artist even get nominated for a golden guitar. You will get people who you have never heard of before on labels quite often, you know, that you have never heard of before and you go, where are these, you know, where do these people come from? Well, I'm not saying that they're not talented. I don't, you know, I don't know, because you never hear of them again afterwards. Um, but um, it's just, yes, yeah, this, this one-eyed, blinkered, um, very dogmatic um, attempt at keeping the status quo the way it has always been. One of the reasons I think why the country music establishment doesn't like us is that they, they, they can smell us a mile off. They know we're lefties. You can tell by our demeanour and our dress and our um, ideas. You don't have to sing the Internationale to be, to be, to, for people to know that you, you're not a, a boater wearing, yacht sailing yuppie, you know? They're never gonna be in that, in that group of, um, uh, of mainstream accepted establishment country in Australia. There'll always be a bit of an outsider. But I think uh, we, we'd occupy a pretty, at the moment, a um, bit of a precarious niche, but I think it'll actually be, be our saving in that we are able to be the crossover from rock and the country scene, and also um, a different scene again, which is just a touring in the, in the outback. Um, I don't think the, the, the Remains ever wanted to be in that club, but they probably would like to make a living. I talk to our artists all the time about this, and you know the response back 
all the time and have been constantly is the fact that if we don't tour, we don't live, we don't eat. I think that they could really make, uh, end up, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a country music version of, uh, of uh, Midnight Oil, maybe which would be great for them. This kind of business is a matter of you've got to keep doing it and keep plugging away and build it up because if you're expecting any quick fixes, you're in, in the wrong business. Because we've seen bands rise like that, like Midnight Oil, you know, all these other bands have played for ages, you know, and they just built up this huge following. They, you know, that they didn't just come out with the, these mega hits that just propelled them, you know, suddenly. They were, they were around for a long time before they were, you know, eventually discovered type thing. Triple J is like a, if you, you can imagine a scaffold. You know, Triple J is a, a, like, a, a, um, to get to a certain height, you've got to go up these certain levels. Mm -hmm. And what I think we're doing is making our own scaffold and, and getting up our own level one at a time. And you know, going to the territories one level and going to Tamworth Country Music Festival is another and going playing Sydney and Melbourne in the rock venues is another. And at, at some point we'll be able to just sort of peer over and we'll be on the same level as, as these Triple J's act, acts. And once, their little, once they've had their day in the sun, their little scaffold will be removed and they'll be sank, taken to the bottom because the nature of Triple J is that they need someone else new the next day, they need novelty. Whereas they can't do that to us, so we'll still be there. Take it as you